Federal Reserve's Kansas City annual symposium is kicking off today in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. President Trump renewing his attack on the Fed on Twitter this morning, saying the economy is doing really well. The Federal Reserve can easily make it record setting. The question is being asked, why are we paying much more in interest than Germany and certain other countries? Be early for a change, not late. Let America win big rather than just win. Joining us from Jackson Hole is Yahoo Finance's Brian Chung. And Brian, there's so much you're going to share with us. But, you know, the president's comment about Germany winning that bond auction they had yesterday, some people are saying it actually failed. They, they weren't able to sell the entire offering that came to market. Yeah, Adam, well, as you mentioned, this is just part of a thread of tweets from President Trump harping on the same idea that he said in the past, which is that he would prefer easier money and easier monetary policy from the Federal Reserve here in the United States. And this is all coming as the Fed descends here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for a uh, two-day conference, at, well, I guess three-day conference that actually begins tonight uh, through Saturday, where policymakers will be meeting with other central bankers around the world. Keep in mind, this is not just a Fed conference, uh, meeting with other central bankers around the world to talk about what the next step should be in terms of battling what is concerns over a global slowdown. I had the chance to sit down with Kansas City Fed President Esther George, who is a voting member of this year's FOMC, to talk a little bit about policy. And she is someone who does not agree with easing policy. Here's what she had to say. So I think what we've seen so far, and I take this from our own business contacts who talk about how they're thinking about uh, investment, when you have high levels of uncertainty, that can cause you to pull back. And I think that's what we're seeing. Cutting interest rates is not likely to resolve that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So I take that into account when I think about um, how will these, how will our policy settings help um, in these situations, or are there other things we should be taking into account? So uncertainty is a challenging one. It doesn't mean that it can't affect the real economy. And I think the more persistent that uncertainty is, that's what I'm watching for. Will it begin to spill over to consumer confidence, for example, and cause the consumer to pull back? So as you can hear from Kansas City Fed President Esther George, she doesn't really see the case for making rate cuts in response to trade concerns. As we heard from Chairman Jerome Powell in the meeting July 31st, where they did decide to lower rates by 25 basis points, he said that it was an insurance cut to hedge against the possible negative effects of an escalating trade war with China. So a lot of concerns here. Again, the conference will kick off tonight and uh, will begin for the most of the day tomorrow. We'll have plenty of coverage of that in addition to more interviews uh, tomorrow. You can catch all that here on sure. Yahoo Finance in addition to a full transcript and video of my interview with Esther George. Brian, I just have to follow up with you. We've seen the 210 invert again, and we had the comments mm -hmm. from Philadelphia's Harker, who's not a voting member now on the FOMC, but will be right. next year. And he's kind of saying uh, that we're roughly where neutral is. Uh, hard to know exactly where neutral is, but I think we're roughly where neutral is right now. I think we should stay here for a while and see how things play out. Doesn't sound like he's going to be a dove when it comes to cutting interest rates. And that may have came, come as a surprise to some who maybe expected Harker to be one of the more dovish members of the Fed. As you mentioned, he is not currently a voting member of the FOMC. But you do raise this question about how people are viewing uh, the yield curve inversion, as you also mentioned, with the 2 and 10 dipping into the negative again today. Uh, this is something I had the chance to ask Esther George about. And she said that we have to be very careful about the way that we read the yield curve. Yes, it has predicted the last few recessions, actually 707 dating back to 1969. But uh, she said that things could be different different this time around, although she's cautious about saying that, but did note that there are global pressures that are contributing to U.S. Treasuries falling across the board. So saying that maybe we need to be careful about what our next moves are. We shouldn't be too quick to cut rates. What I have noticed is that in the Jackson Hole meeting, keep in mind that these media interviews tend to happen among other publications and outlets as well. A lot of the speakers that have spoken so far uh, have been the more hawkish members uh, of the Fed. So maybe we get some more dovish commentary from other from the other side of the Fed at the conference uh, throughout the next few days. So it'll be interesting to see. But as you mentioned, it seems like I don't see any hawks around me for right now, but it seems like the hawks have been the ones that have been uh, speaking so far. You are in your element in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Brian Chung, thank you. We're going to keep talking about this. Uh, Andy, I got to ask mm -hmm. you, though, the pressure isn't just economic pressure. There's pressure by the bond market. And as people don't get yield, say, when they buy a German Bund, they're going to be buying perhaps U.S. Treasuries to protect themselves. And they push the yields down. 1,000 percent, Adam, and I'm actually doing a bunch of work right now on negative interest rates, 
which are a huge part of the overall fixed income equation, particularly in Japan and in Europe. And yes, in fact, those investors are coming here and pushing those rates, as you say. And to some observers, this is truly distorting our yield curve and making it actually untenable in terms of being able to read where the economy and where the bond market is versus historical norms, which to me is kind of just one other slightly dangerous element of negative rates. And one of the, the factors with negative rates, we've got, I think, is it 15 or 16 trillion 16 in trillion. sovereign debt that yeah. yields negative rates. Total, a total fixed income, yeah, yeah. which is mostly sovereign. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting you point that out. I, I feel like there, there's two narratives at play that we should be looking for. On the one hand, you talk about uh, looking to the yield curve as an indicator of a recession, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily accurate when you consider the easy monetary policies we've seen over the last 10 years, right? You look at what's happened with the ECB, the BOJ is probably the best example of just how much they've distorted that. So if you think about those in Japan, those in Europe, Europe, they're seek searching for yield. They're going to come over to the U.S. and see the treasury. The treasury is still yielding more um, than you would see anywhere mm -hmm. else globally. A at the same time, I think that this expectation that the president has set that additional rate cuts will stimulate the economy is a dangerous one. Because if you look at what has mm -hmm. happened, again, in those same regions we keep right. pointing to, it just hasn't helped even at negative rates. The other thing is it 1,000 percent enables President Trump to engage in a trade war. In other words, I need lower rates because I'm doing this trade war thing over here. So you got to help me out, buddy. And, you know, well, there are unintended consequences to that, right? In other words, it's not just a free lunch for the president to get lower rates because he wants to blow up the world trade scene. And I think we're seeing that right now. And also, you know, how's that going to play out? A huge amount of uncertainty there, Adam. Well,